another question we have a series of questions but all of these questions from the sister are connected with the issue of kafala custody for example uh, she asks assalamu alaikum can you clarify the ruling on custody and kafala can women get the custody after the age of uh, discernment also how and when children's consent is taken to decide the custody about the mother what is the minimum age of custody and so on and so forth uh, see the principle is and this is about uh, the custody of the child after divorce basically this is after talaq or the scholars they call it hadana the caretaking of the child who who has more right father or the mother uh, the scholars they agree that the mother has more right on on caretaking of the child and there are many reasons one of the reasons is uh, keeping in mind the emotional upbringing and it, mother is more attached and the child is more attached to the mother and so on and so forth so hadana caretaking custody is the right of the mother till the age of puberty till the age of discernment after that the child will be given choice and there are particular hadith about that practical hadith in which the prophet sallallahu alaihi asked the child do you want to after the age of uh, discernment the prophet asked the child do you want to go with your father or mother the child he chose the mother and she took the child this is in principle and this is the principle but there are some exceptions based on certain conditions and needs if the father can prove that the mother will not be able to fulfill uh, or she will not be able to fulfill the conditions of custody and she will not be able to uh, do justice with the upbringing of the child and uh, hadana uh, caretaking if he can prove prove that with uh, with proper evidences then this is this custody is shifted to the father for example the mother may, may not have a source of income or other things but even in that case this becomes a dispute so in disputes we have the qadi to solve the dispute and he will uh, consider many things in in giving the verdict or the judgment he will consider the economic situation of the parents he will consider the emotional attachment he will consider everything but in principle hadana is the right of the mother hadana is not the right of the father till the age of discernment okay always remember we have the principles in ahkam and we have the exceptions or the implementation of the principles which is also ijtihad by the way ijtihad if you have a principle or a ruling before applying it in a particular case the mufti the scholar the qadi must uh, go into details there are certain conditions there are certain uh, uh, yani details after that he can apply uh, the ruling okay so hadana is the right of 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 the mother but with some conditions if those conditions are not met it is shifted to the some in some scholars even say it's it's shifted to the grandmother and from from the mother side and if she is not able to fulfill it shifts to the father so on and so forth if no one is able then it is the duty of the community leader and eventually it goes to the khalifa so on and so forth but usually in these disputes we must solve it uh, according to the morality of islam the the relatives must get involved or before that the parents both they sit together even if they decide that we can't live together anymore and we separate our paths but still the children have the right to live the children have to uh, their right uh, to uh, yani not to face hardship and uh, difficulty so the parents must decide about that okay yes wallahu ta'ala ta'ala Uh, assalamu alaikum have classical scholars discussed kashf and ilham as a method or replacement of ijtihad uh, kashf and ilham we talked about it in the previous session it is not a replacement for ijtihad ijtihad is ijtihad and the methodology is zahir it, it is uh, yani apparent we cannot make something which is subjective as a method of ijtihad uh, 
but kashf and ilham has its role and in fact you will see ilham uh, the discussion about ilham in almost all books of usul al fiqh even the primary sources they discuss ilham as a method of uh, judgment or or uh, understanding the ruling extracting the ruling in usul al fiqh and we have scholars who uh, prefer ilham on some disagreed upon evidences in usul al fiqh like imam ibn taymiyah rahim, rahimahullah uh, in uh, many places he says that ilham is better than maslaha mursala ilham is better than maslaha on many occasions so there are scholars who have preferred ilham of course with the conditions every passing thought is not ilham i'm not going into that you can refer to the books of usul al fiqh and the books of tasawwuf in understanding ilham and differentiating between valid and invalid ilham but ilham you know we talked about this in the previous session in order to clear the confusion we have a lot of confusion about some basic matters of our deen unfortunately we talked about epistemology we have a broad epistemology these are valid methods so the books of usul al fiqh mention ilham even dreams some invalid methods of ijtihad valid methods they have discussed so yes ilham is a valid method when applied properly and if you remember we said ilham is restricted it's not like wahi wahi is unrestricted whatever comes in wahi we accept it ilham will be understood in the light of wahi so anything which contradicts quran and sunnah contradicts uh, established rulings of islam will not be accepted irrespective of who claims it okay we have to understand the meaning we have to understand the role of these methods so you can refer to the books of usul al fiqh you will see they have discussed about ilham and uh, its role in ijtihad so it's not a replacement of ijtihad we can say it is a method from the methods of ijtihad a mujtahid must be pious so for example why in 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 uh, discussion about mujtahidun they say that he must be a practicing muslim in all books of even mufti if you see uh, adab al ifta or the chapters about ijtihad he must be a practicing muslim so it's not sufficient to only acquire the tools arabic language understanding hadith this can be done by a non muslim also practicing muslim because of tawfiq which comes from allah now another question is about a hadith a famous hadith in bukhari and other books which is also in the 40 hadith of imam an nawawi rahimahullah uh about the stages of a human being in the womb of his mother the brother asks about this hadith i read the explanation of sheikh jamaluddin zarabazu which is a famous commentary in english about this hadith where he has gone at length in explaining this hadith and mentioned that the word nutfa the first stage nutfa mudgha alaqa these are the three stages of a human being uh with agreement yani from the quran itself so the word nutfa is not present in actual sources he mentions that all the three atwar all the three stages that take place uh, they happen in the first 40 days okay so if the word nutfa is added to the hadith it means 40 days 40 days 40 days for three stages so 120 days which is uh, uh four months and there are certain ahkam based on this classification but if we remove the word nutfa from the hadith all these three stages they happen in 40 days which is more uh, correct according to the modern science this is what he is asking uh, because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in the, in the beginning of the hadith inna ahadakum uh, yujma'u khalquhu fi batni ummihi 40 yawma if if we remove nutfa uh, the prophet said uh, the creation happens in 40 days so is it 4 months or 40 is it 120 days or 40 days there is this agreement based on the wording of the hadith see for imam an nawawi when he mentioned it of course the word nutfa is not there in the original sources in bukhari or muslim now when we see bukhari which is with us the word nutfa is not there but where did imam an nawawi get this word from yani didn't he use the original sources to compile his work yes but we have to remember that 
the books of Sunnah, usually uh, they, they had different narrations based on different students. So the traditional scholars, they would not base their understanding uh, of, of these hadith or taking the wording of the hadith on the published books. Now we have published Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, and these books. They had their own narrations. For example, Imam al-Nawawi had his own narration from his teachers of Bukhari, of Muslim, of these books. And maybe in one of these narrations, the word nutfa was present, but the published work which we have now, it is, it is not there. Okay, so don't get confused. There are narrations. For Imam al-Bukhari, he taught his book orally. Usually they, the muhaddithun, they, they, whatever they taught, they uh, memorized it. They had these hadith in their memory. For example, Imam al-Bukhari, he taught Bukhari, it was in his memory. He would teach to students and these students, they narrated further. So they are were different narrations. This is the traditional method of, of uh, understanding hadith. When you study hadith, you don't base it on, only on the published work. Now it's published, but you study with a muhaddith, with your teachers who gives you a, a, a ijazah through his chain. You can narrate through his chain. So sometimes in these chains, there would be uh, additions or deletions in the words, which is okay, which is fine because the majority of hadith is riwayah bil ma'na, riwayah of the narrators, Sahaba and others by meaning. So they replaced the words, the meaning remained same. But yes, according to my personal opinion also, uh, all these three stages, they happen in 40 days. Because the nutfa, uh, yani, Imam al-Nawawi, we excuse him for mentioning nutfa here because he, he, may, may, he uh, may have his own narration of Bukhari and Muslim, which contain this. Uh, word. But what we have, it is not there, so we will stick to that. But there is difference of opinion. For example, aborting the fetus before this period. Because after 40 days or 120 days, the Prophet ﷺ said, the spirit, the soul is, uh, the angel comes and he blows the soul into uh, the body. So the, the life starts when the soul is blown into the body. If we say 40 days, what, what is the ruling of uh, aborting the fetus? Of course, if there is a need, not unnecessarily, before 40 days. And if we take 120 days, four months, what is the ruling of aborting the fetus before 120 days? There is difference of opinion between the scholars. Now, there is another question uh, by a sister. She's asking about uh, a married couple and the dispute or the problem uh, in their relationship. And it's better I will answer uh, her personally. If she asks me, you can uh, send me a message because uh, yeah, case to case study is something different. Here we are talking more about general ahkam. Okay, so uh, I will give Nasiha personally about the dispute or the insult she is facing. What should she do? This is a personal matter, I will not take this question. Now, the mother has seven-year-old daughter who wants to stay with the mother and doesn't want to go to the father. Can the mother maintain the custody in this case? Uh, we have answered this question. We have answered the scenarios in which the custody is transferred and the principle in this uh, masala. Another question is about the hair dye. Black color is... Uh, Haram, other colors are allowed. Yeah, and this is the majority opinion. Even there is difference of opinion about the black color. Can we dye our hair or beard with black color on certain occasions for a mujahid, a certain okay, so on and so forth? There is difference of opinion, but it's uh, permissible. It's okay to dye with any other color. You can uh, dye your hair when you uh, start feeling that you are becoming old, you can, but uh, retaining uh, the whiteness on your, on your beard, for, in particular for, for brothers, it has virtue. There are certain hadith in which the Prophet Sallallahu he declared the whiteness on the beard as nur of a believer. So you can keep it, you can change it by the color. And also uh, 
the, it is from the Sunnah of the Prophet he, he would use Hina and Kala on his blessed beard, so on and so forth. Now, another question is about the maintenance of the children. If the children decide to stay with mother after seven years, given that mother has decided that she will never get married again, is the father obliged to pro provide maintenance for the children until they become independent? Uh, see, in the maintenance, nafaqa, uh, after talaq, we have two types of talaq. First, understand the principle, then I will come back to the question. We have two types of talaq. Uh, talaq raji'i and tal talaq da'in. Talaq raji'i is when you, and it's, uh, it's the two talaqs, when uh, they can still re reconcile. Raji'i raji means reconciliation, going back. So in raji'i talaq, the wife has right to uh, nafaqa, and of also the children. Uh, in the idda period, till the idda, the waiting period ends. What about talaq ba'in? The scholars have disagreed. The scholars have disagreed about, about talaq ba'in. Talaq ba'in is after the three talaqs. Because this woman becomes haram uh, for this man forever until she marries another person and by his or her free will they get separated and she goes back. So there is difference of opinion. And usually the maintenance issue is connected with idda, the idda period. After idda, there is no maintenance. About the children, yes, the father has to maintain as long as because. They have separated, but the, the, the children, they are attributed to the father. The father has, they have right on their father. He will always remain their father uh, till the last day, right? So he has to provide for the maintenance. And in some masail, the scholars have compared between providing for the children, if they are not earning and they, they, are, uh, they are weak or they are uh, yani, weak because of their age, they cannot earn, and providing for the parents, if the parents are poor. Allah has given you wealth, now you have to prioritize. Sometimes the decisions are very difficult, but scholars have discussed these situations as well. So should you provide for the parents and or, or, or provide for your children? The scholars, they say that providing for the children uh, is more important than providing for the parents if they are poor. And if you only have uh, yani, uh, enough uh, wealth or money, you can only support one side. So you have to provide for your children. Yeah, but if you can uh, create a balance between the two, that's also good. So yes, the father has to provide for the maintenance, but according to the mutual agreement. Yani, see, I uh, said this many times that we should not look into the ahkam from only legal perspective. Many things are legal, but other areas are also involved. Morality is involved. Mutual decisions are involved. Okay, sometimes it is not your legal right, but you have to do it. Otherwise, uh, a lot of facade will happen. So these things are uh, decided by mutual agreement. If you're not in that position, you involve relatives, you involve good people, you may involve a scholar, a judge who can uh, decide in this dispute, so on, so on and so forth. But Islamically, see, uh, legal ahkam in our times, Islam is not implemented in our societies. So a person may easily escape from uh, liability and responsibility or even punishment. But in these ahkam, uh, there is punishment in akhirah. There is responsibility in akhirah. Okay, that's why morality is involved. So responsibility is not only physical, it is also moral. Okay, so as a practicing Muslim, I must understand my responsibilities. If it is an Islamic responsibility, I must fulfill it. Otherwise I'm sinful and responsible on the last day. And being responsible on the last day, accountability on the last day is more tough than the accountability in dunya. Another question. Uh, I want to know the opinion of Hanafi madhab on riba in countries like India, because many scholars say that it is permissible to take loans, bank jobs, bank interest in countries like India. Naam, yani the Hanafi opinion 
about riba, riba is haram with agreement of scholars from the Quran itself. The both types of riba, riba al-fadl and riba al-nasi. I will not go into the details. You can read about it. So riba is haram. It uh, carries uh, sin, punishment on the last day. Its hurma is very severe. Um, th this is with agreement of the scholars. Uh, what is the Hanafi madhab about riba? Hanafis, they don't say riba is halal or permissible. In a certain uh, situation, they declare a certain type of riba permissible. In the situation of war, Darul Harb, the abode of war when Muslims are fighting, in that situation, they say that it is permissible to engage in riba with non-Muslims and between Muslims who have not migrated to Darul Islam. This is the detail, okay? But now is India Darul Harb? Where is Darul Islam? Darul Harb means uh, a place uh, with which the Muslim state is, uh, the Muslim uh, state is in a situation of war. Now, if you say Darul Harb, where is the Muslim state, which is in situation of war or state of war? I will not go into that. I will not go into that. But uh, this is the Hanafi opinion and not all Hanafis. For example, Abu Yusuf, Qadi Abu Yusuf, rahimahullah, he is with the majority in this masala. All types of riba are haram in all situations. The hurma, prohibition of riba, is maintained in all situations, whether it's warfare, peace, any place. So they say the majority, including Imam Abu Yusuf from the Hanafis, they say the ahkam of Islam, particularly the basic ahkam, they remain same in all conditions, in all situations, in all places. There is no change. Uh, but the opinion of Abu Hanifa and Imam Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani, rahimahullah, is what we uh, explained. Okay, but we should take the majority opinion. Avoid riba, don't take loans, protect yourself. Except if it is forced on us or yeah, this is a, uh, again, we must differentiate between, as I said, between uh, explaining a ruling and a fatwa. So fatwa will be case to case, understanding the conditions of a person, situation, his situation, and it would be decided according to that. But in ruling, in da'wah, in irshad, in education, ed educating Muslims, in uh, giving da'wah, we have to maintain the uh, ahkam of Islam. We have to uh, explain the obligations. We have to uh, talk about the prohibitions and maintain. Okay, so let's take the majority opinion because Hanafis, uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Muhammad, they don't say revise halal. They uh, base this opinion uh, yani they they uh, declare a certain type of riba in a certain situation, state of war, halal between certain people. Yani they see this is very really tricky. They don't say that it is halal between Muslims of Darul Islam uh, from Darul Islam, a, a Muslim from Darul Islam and a Muslim from Darul Harb. They don't say that. They say it is uh, halal between uh, two Muslims or a Muslim and a Kafir in Darul Harb, those who have not migrated. And what, what are their evidences? They have their evidence. For example, they have a Mursal Hadith uh, as their evidence in which the Prophet وسلم, said, there is no riba between uh, these people. And the majority have counter argued. They have questioned the authenticity of this narration even if uh, we accept it, they say that we will interpret it. It means that the riba is prohibited. It does not mean there is no riba, right? So they have their uh, understandings. But in these matters, in difference of opinion, we should always take precaution. Like in worldly matters, we take precaution. We maintain a gap between us and hardship and difficulty. Same applies on religious matters. We should not try to scratch and uh, yani search for easy opinions to obey our whims and desires. This is haram. That's why we have this concept in fiqh, which we call al-khuruj min al-khilaf. Al-khuruj min al-khilaf is if, if scholars have disagreed about an action, about the obligation and uh, 
uh, is, is a particular action obligatory or recommended, they say doing it is better. Doing it is better because if scholars have disagreed about an action, is it uh, haram or uh, permissible? It is better to avoid it. To protect. Ihtiyat is one of the principles of Islam. Now, uh, another question from a sister is about education. It's a lengthy question. I will not read it. She asks about uh, the subjects like mathematics, computers, teaching it to someone. How can we connect these subjects to Islam in education? I'm interested in education. How can I study Islam? So this is a lengthy question. Coming to the first part, how can we connect these modern sciences with Islam? We have two types of Western sciences, the empirical sciences, which we may call funun, funun, uh, medicine, uh, engineering, uh, mathematics. Some of these uh, were branches of philosophy in the past, like mathematics was a branch of philosophy in the early Western philosophy, the Greek philosophy, Aristotle and, and stuff. But eventually, it was separated and it became a branch of empirical sciences. Empirical sciences deals with the physical phenomena. Most of these sciences, uh, they are a common legacy between human beings. How to operate, how to understand the, the diseases, uh, medicine, how to construct. In spite of the fact that all these empirical sciences, they, uh, they are also a manifestation of the philosophy uh, yani of the worldview which they belong to. You know, for architecture, how we construct the house, architecture. Generally speaking, it has nothing to do with philosophy, worldview. It has nothing to do with belief in dunya or akhira or uh, angels, right? But the architecture also depicts your worldview. For example, post-postmodernism, modernism, these philosophies in the West, uh, the architecture, uh, which is practiced now, it depicts this philosophy. And the chaotic architecture, yeah, it doesn't have a prop, it doesn't have a certain shape and form. It's chaotic from all sides. It depicts, and this is new architecture, it depicts the philosophy. So what I'm saying is these sciences, which may seem uh, technology, for example, uh, medicine, all these empirical sciences, which may seem neutral, yeah, they have nothing to do with philosophy. They are a common legacy between human beings, uh, this is true and untrue at the same time. So a certain part is true, but uh, it, it is not influenced by the worldview which produced these sciences is uh, untrue. And it, you will see the manifestation, I'm not going to that. But yes, empirical sciences is generally, they are a common legacy between, uh, between uh, all human beings. For example, a Muslim, a practicing Muslim, a good Muslim who is loyal to his worldview can be a good doctor at the same time and he's serving humanity. This is fine. Now coming to the second type, which is the other type, which is social sciences. Social sciences. Uh, yani in our times, it is usually the empirical sciences which sells. A doctor, an engineer, technology is selling, right? These are the areas in which we earn money. Social sciences, philosophy, sociology, psychology, who cares about it? But we forget that these are the real sciences. This is what defines the society. Social sciences is the main depiction or manifestation of the worldview. Okay, so we should not be thinking about how to connect these empirical sciences with Islam. Uh, <laughs> and uh, practicing a reductionist methodology in that. For example, we find a scientific fact, we, we search for the ayah and we connect it with the ayah. We say, oh, this has been mentioned in the Quran. This is a redu reductionist method. Yani this is foolishness, wallahi. Forget about that. Think about social sciences because these are the sciences which define us. The, the, the philosophy, sociology, like we talked about sexual behavior, sociology of sex, uh, econ economy, political theories. This is the modern age, Western civilization is dominant, Western social sciences are dominant, or the 
the, the manifestation of the Western civilization which we see around us is based on these theories which come from uh, the, the social sciences of the West. So for, for this reason, the scholars who were concerned about it, they focused on Islamization of social sciences. And they are not talking about medicine and stuff. How to Islamize social sciences? For example, this project was taken by some great minds like Dr. Ismail Raji al Faruqi. He was a great thinker, philosopher, Arab from Palestine, but he lived in the uh, United States. And eventually he was assassinated there, he was killed. Uh, read his books about, he, he was the one, and before him, uh, a Malaysian uh, philosopher, thinker, uh, Naqib al Attas. And he claims that Ismail Raji took it from me. He stole this idea from me. Uh, whatever is the fact, we don't go into that. But these are some great minds who focused on, and they said the revival of the Ummah depends on creating our own social sciences, or at least Islamizing the social sciences, which the Western social sciences. And this is a very important project. But he was assassinated. And after him, I don't think those who followed it they were able to understand him or they were able to take the project at the same pace. But this is a project. So how to connect these subjects? Think about social sciences because it affects particularly the child education, how society is understood, how the, the, the answer to the realities, the worldview, epistemology, education, what is knowledge, what are the types, so on and so forth. This is all social sciences, okay? so. Mathematics, computers, and stuff, this is a common legacy between human beings. We can learn it. But again, as I said, they are not also, uh, these, these empirical sciences are not safe from the influence of the worldview which, which, uh, uh, which influenced them or, or uh, from which it sprouted. It is not safe, but still. So yes, you can, uh, I recommend the book, of Dr. Ismail Raji al Faruqi, Rahimahullah, Islamization of Knowledge, Methodology and Work Plan. You can download it. I think it's available PDF. Read it. If you are interested in education, creating a change in education, how to connect these modern sciences with, with Islam, are they compatible? Do we need to create new sciences? If they are compatible, uh, what are the areas in which we have to change them? So on and so forth. This is a very important subject of revival in education. Uh, in the Ummah. Wallahu alam. <clears throat> As a student of knowledge, I'm interested, interested in studying. There are things I know in bits and pieces, uh, but I'm confused where to put my time in as there are so many things around. And, uh, I'm assuming by student of knowledge, you mean the knowledge of Islam. Inshallah, we may do a podcast. I have this in mind about the methodology of studying Islam. How do we study Islam? How do we prioritize? We will discuss it there, inshallah. But you can still connect me, connect with me personally so that uh, yani, I can give you advice according to your needs, particular needs. Wallahu ta'ala. Ta okay, the last question here is, uh, can a father give his child to her elder sister for growing up the child for the sake that her sister doesn't have a child? If they agree, if they are living in the same uh, yani joint family, and this does not harm the rights of the child, because adoption we discussed, but the child has rights, and if the child belo belongs to this particular man, and he is giving the child to her sister. Uh, he has good niya in that. He has good intention. The maqsid is good. But what is the uh, crime or the fault of the child? The child, when he grows up, he will not have that connection and affection with his own uh, father. And he was deprived of the care and love of his parents, own parents, own father. Why was he deprived or why was she deprived? So these are some questions which are important here. If the, the rights of the child are not abused and harmed, like I said, maybe they are living in the same compound, joint family, 
<clears throat> the child is not attributed to the sister. Uh, the rights are safeguarded, but the sister, she helps in upbringing. She, uh, yani she, she loves the child uh, as her own child. This is fine. This is permissible. Normal upbringing. But completely giving up your child to someone else and attributing this child to that person is not permissible in Islam because it involves many evils as, as we said, as we discussed. Now, so khair, these were some questions we took in today's session. And uh, we are taking only questions which are, which are coming in the Telegram group from our students who are joining us in, in the courses, okay? I'm not taking random questions from everywhere. Whatever came here, we discussed that. And the purpose is, as I said, not to give fatwa. Nevertheless, yani you can always refer to the fatwa websites. There are muftis around the globe. There are committees, so on and so forth. The purpose, purpose here is, again, education. Because I'm a teacher, I'm teaching. This is my uh, aim and this is my maqsad. So even in these questions answering, I mentioned the principles, we go into details in order to educate ourselves, connect with uh, our Torah, understand uh, Islam. Uh, and the purpose is contributing to the revival of the Ummah. So this knowledge, if we cannot actualize it, implement it on ground, we cannot benefit the Muslims practically, it's of no use. So, we must always uh, apply our knowledge. We are educated Muslims, alhamdulillah. We must give our contribution in the revival of the ummah. But for that, there are two main conditions, as I said, understand, in understanding. In the, practically on ground, what we have to do, this is a lengthy talk. In understanding, we have to enhance our understanding of two important matters, al-asl. Al-Asl, our Torah, our legacy, Quran, Sunnah. Understanding it in a proper manner. Avoiding simplistic understanding, reductionism, uh, reducing uh, uh, the ulum of Islam, which are based on Quran, Book of Allah, and Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu reducing it to uh, futile disputes uh, is dangerous. So understanding of Asl as it is and cultivating it, cultivating it, in our understanding, in our practice. And number two, understanding of Al-Asr with Ayn, the times we're living in. It's very important. And we know in fatwa, they say before you give a ruling, Al-Hukm Al-Shari, you have to understand the waqir, the reality of the thing about which you are, you are giving a verdict. If you don't know that, or you misunderstand it, uh, your verdict will be mistaken. Al-Hukm ala shay far'un an tasawwurihi. Verdict on a thing or your, your decision uh, about a particular matter will depend on its tasawwur. How do you conceptualize it? How do you understand it? So al-asl and al-asr are very important. Very important. We lack in both. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us understanding of asl and understanding of asr. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make these sessions fruitful. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by his beautiful names and exalted attributes to help us and give us tawfiq in contributing to the revival of the ummah according to our capabilities. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help the oppressed of the ummah to lift the hardship and difficulty from the ummah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on the ummah, to guide the ummah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins, shortcomings, mistakes, overlook our dhunub uh, and khataya. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us sincere students of knowledge and uh, uh, grant barakah in our ilm and amal. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to elevate the ranks of the great scholars from the times of the Sahaba till the end times. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala re resurrect us uh, with, the, the, um, with the prophets, salihin, shuhada, siddiqeen, and scholars on the last day. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to uh, protect us from fitan, ma zahara minha wa ma batan, whether they are apparent or hidden, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us steadfast on this path of 
seeking knowledge, understanding Islam, practicing our deen, da'wah, irshad, revival of the ummah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us, our families, our children, make our children uh, from salihin, muslihin, mujahideen, and ulama al-amileen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept us as uh, sincere servants of his religion, accept our families, accept, accept our uh, uh, children as servants of his deen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by his beautiful names and exalted attributes to cure our sick and to forgive all of our dead. Ameen ya rabbal alameen. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala nabi al-ummi. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inshallah, uh, this was the last session of Q&A for now. We are planning to start a new course uh, from uh, next week. Uh, I have some topics in mind. We may do a uh, matan in usul al-fiqh. Or I will, inshallah, reflect on this. I have some topics in mind. We will uh, announce it soon on social networking of uh, Darul Ilim. Bi'idhnillah. And uh, we will be uh, also engaging in Q&As in future. Sometimes we take a break between uh, the courses and do a Q&A, connect with our students, interact, inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tawfiq. Make dua for me and my family. Inshallah. Khairan. See you. Assalamu alaikum. Wa rahmatullahi. Wa barakatuh.